This podcast is part of the Tremula Network, adventure and outdoor podcasts off the beaten track. To find out more, head to tremula.network or find us on socials. This episode is sponsored by Bedenoch the Storylands, a campaign by the Bedenoch Heritage Group and Visit Cairngorms that shines the light on the abundance of stories, music and history you can discover across this region in the heart of the Scottish Highlands. Find out more at bedenochstorylands.com Hello there, and welcome to Wild for Scotland, a podcast full of inspiring stories from Scotland. I'm your host, Cathy Camleitner. Wild for Scotland helps you connect with Scotland and dream about future adventures. I'll tell you immersive stories to whisk you away, share some of my top tips for your own Scotland trip, and introduce you to inspiring locals and their stories. So lean back and enjoy. Let's travel to Scotland. Happy New Year! I know it's already February, but since this is the first new episode on our podcast feed this year, I think it's still okay to say that. Today we have a very special episode for you. Back in September, I was invited to spend a few days in Badenoch, a hidden gem in the heart of the Scottish Highlands, to experience all the things the region has to offer. Badenoch lies within the Cairngorms National Park, and there are five main villages here. King Yussi, Newton Moor, Kincraig, Lagan and Dalwini. Water is everywhere in this area, from the fast-flowing river Spey to countless lochs and lochens framed by pine trees and mountain ranges. Nature, history, heritage, food and drink, traditional Scottish games and plenty of outdoor activities. I got to dip my toes into a lot of different experiences during my trip and I'm excited to tell you more about them in today's story. Of course, I'm not able to mention absolutely everything I did during my trip. So if you feel inspired to plan a trip to Badenoch after listening, make sure you check out my Badenoch travel guide. You'll find the link in the show notes. One of the best tools I used on my trip was the Badenoch The Storylands app. It was the perfect companion with music and stories for my journey. I'll tell you more about it in a little while. You'll notice that the episode is a little longer than usually, and that's because I spoke to many Bedenoch locals during my trip. You'll hear some of them as we go along. Additional music in this episode is by Charlie McCarran of Capper Cayley and Session A9, who composed an entire suite of music for Bedenoch The Storylands. You'll find all the songs on the Storylands app. Thank you, Charlie, for letting us use some of my favourite tunes in this episode. And now, without further ado... Let's travel to Bedenoch. This is the land of stories. I'm standing on a hillside as I turn around to look at the view. Doing so was a very fortunate decision, one I'd like to pretend I made very intentionally. But in reality, I simply needed a break to catch my breath. Too bad that the landscape had other plans, because breathtaking is just the word to describe this view. Below me lies a rolling landscape, craggy knolls buried beneath a thick layer of heather, a few remaining purple blossoms struggling in a desperate fight against time. A narrow band of pine trees separates the mountains from the bottom of the glen. I can see houses and roads, a wide river, and several miles in the distance, another mountain range rising high towards the sky. The peaks are shrouded in clouds, peeking out as the wind pushes them deeper into the range. I'm in Bedenoch climbing a hill above Kinyusi, one of the bustling villages of the region. The river below is the Spey, one of Scotland's longest rivers. 
Its source lies deep in the mountains west of here, and after forging its way through the hills and forests of the highlands for nearly a hundred miles, it flows through the famous Speyside whisky region into the Moray Firth. Here in Badenoch, it splits the wide glen into two, picks up contributories along the way, and forms marshes and lochs that may contribute to the name of the area. After all, Badenoch means the drowned land. But it's not just water that has left its marks on this land. Badenoch is, and always has been, a cultural cradle for Scotland. The Jacobites, Highland clearances, clan wars, the Industrial Revolution, Celtic traditions, the Picts, whisky production, and legends of mythical creatures. There is no part of Scottish culture that hasn't touched Badenoch in some sort of way. At the heart of all of this lie stories. Stories of legendary sons and daughters, beliefs and superstitions, glorious battles and things that were or could have been. And coming here is the perfect opportunity to hear them told by the people who know them best, the locals of Badenoch. These stories are what I'm here to explore. In the footsteps of storytellers before me, let me take you to Badenoch, the Storylands. From Glasgow, it is about a three-hour drive to Kingusi, my first stop on this trip. On my way up, I listen to Tales on the Storylands app read by locals from Badenoch about the region's history and folk tales from way back. ...and could play three sets of bagpipes at the same time while dancing the Highland Fling. Word has it that he could play for days on end without ever getting tired and without ever repeating a tune, and that once he played a great pibrach that lasted for a week upon the legendary black chanter of old clan. After checking into my hotel in the village... I put on my hiking boots and start walking. And that's where I am now, about halfway off Craig Lake, the wee house mountain of Kingusi. Across the glen, I can see the Cairngorms rising, steep peaks and a never-ending plateau, covered in a patchy pattern of greys, greens, browns and purple. There's a rainbow in the sky, and I can see heavy clouds burdened by rain moving closer from a distance. It's sunny and windy, and rain is in the air. Everything all at once, just as you'd expect it in the Scottish Highlands. As I reach the summit, I can see more of Kingusi. There is a small hill just outside the village. For hundreds of years, a castle sat on its top, overlooking the glen. It was owned by the wolf of Badenoch, who ruled these lands, with an iron fist. But the ruins I see are not of this time. They are the ruins of Ruthman Barracks, once home to two companies of British government soldiers. The Jacobites stormed the site in 1746 and destroyed it after the devastating defeat at Culloden. Only the walls have been left behind, leaving a haunting ruin in the landscape. From up here, though, Details like this blend into the natural landscape like it's painted with a broad brush. Mountains, fields, forests and rivers dominate the picture. I follow the wide ridge to the backside of the hill and start my descent towards Loch Gynac. Deep blue waters nestled among the peaks, hidden from sight and framed by the heather. Birch trees line the rocky path, their flexible branches swaying in the wind yellow leaves losing their grip and sailing smoothly through the air. Moss and bracken, blueberries and heather cover the ground between them, a soft bed hiding boulders and tree trunks, those legendary gates to the fairies that I heard about in the Badenoch tales. From the loch, a burn flows down to the village and the path runs alongside it. The Gynock burn brought prosperity to King Yusi a woollen mill powered by the infinite forces of the water, and an industrialist who turned a small settlement into a sprawling village. Today the mill is long gone, but a few dams remain on the burn. I cross several footbridges as I follow the path. I hear waterfalls below me and bubbling pools. 
I stop to take a picture and notice a red squirrel jumping from one side of the bridge to the other. I watch as it scurries away, its sharp claws rustling along the dry bark of a pine tree. After it's gone, I look at my phone and, to my delight, I discover that I captured the squirrel mid-air. A red flurry of fluff on the run. This dance between nature and history brings me to my next destination. The Highland Folk Museum lies on the outskirts of Newton Moor, another Badenoch village just a few miles from King Lucy. The museum was founded by a historian Isabel Francis Grant from Edinburgh. She took an interest in the mundane life of the Highlands and started collecting pieces of everyday life, things that no other historian would pay attention to in her days. Even the Highlanders she got them from wondered why she would want to keep them. Soon she had collected over 2,000 pieces and exhibited them first in Inverness and then in a museum on the Isle of Iona. In 1939, she brought her collection to Badenoch and found a permanent home in Kinyusi. Today the museum has moved to a large site in Newton Moor and includes not just objects, but many buildings from all over the Highlands, spanning from the 1700s to the mid-20th century. It is here that I meet Helen Pickles, the curator of the Highland Folk Museum. ...in this uh, wonderful site. Can you tell us a little bit about the Highland Folk Museum, maybe for listeners who've not been before or have never heard about it before? What is it like and what can we imagine what it looks like? So we're an open-air museum, so Britain's mainland Britain's first open-air museum, uh, and the site is spread across 80 acres. We're one mile from end to end, and there's around 30 buildings that uh, visitors can explore, which tells the history of the Highlands over the past 300 years. We also have a, a collection store as well. We've got a, n- a new facility here that opened in 2013, a purpose-built store for the collections, so visitors can and book uh, in advance to come and see the collections that we have in store. But, yeah, we cover a, a great variety of buildings and time periods um, and we also have a cafe and shop and playground for kids and it's a fantastic day out for all the family you can spend an hour here and a day here and a week here <laughs> as you've discovered <laughs> absolutely so this is my second visit in two days <laughs> I've kind of split it up and every time I explore a different part of the museum because it is massive and so widespread in different parts and different kinds of landscapes as well which is Really lovely to think that it's not just about the buildings, it's also about the landscape that they sit in. That's right, yeah. We're we're split mainly into three sections. So we're currently in the Croft section, so the Alt Larry Croft. So that was one of the original parts of this site when we took it over, when the Highland Council took it over in the 1980s. So it had originally been a farm, a small croft. So we have the Croft House here, which we're looking over to now. Uh, where we have a sweetie shop, so visitors can come and buy some traditional sweeties in there, and a post office, and then we have the traditional farmsteading buildings as well, so we have stables and cattle buyer and a worker's cottage as well, tin cottage, so it really gives a feeling of how people lived and, and farmed in a small highland farm. We then move through the site up into the middle village, the Balaminach, where we have the Shinty Pavilion, Lock and Hooley House, which is a 1950s, it's recreated back to the 1950s, um, which is probably the most modern uh, building that we have here. Mm-hmm. So we go up, up to that date. Uh, we have a school, which actually came from Knockbane Parish, which is near Inverness. And so that's 1930s schooling. And we have, most of the time we have a school teacher in there, so visitors can come in and get a flavour for school life <laughs> in the 1930s. <laughs> And then we, sh- we show other trades and industries as well in the middle village. So we have a tweed cottage and tailor's cottage and we have a joiner's workshop as well. So we're really telling the story of how people lived and worked in the whole of the Highlands because many of the buildings have come from different parts of the Highlands mm-hmm. and moved here. It must be quite an undertaking to have someone who you know, is trained in, in modern building techniques to then strip that knowledge back a little bit and imagine how a building was built back then to then reconstruct 
Yeah, we, we have an amazing team here of uh, very skilled traditional craftspeople. Mm. So one of the traditional building methods that we really focus on here, which you'll have seen in the, the buildings that we have, is turf building and thatching. Mm. So the buildings up at the township, for example, the 1730s recreated township, they're of kind of a, a low stone base and then turf walls. And then a crook frames, so crook timber frames, and then thatch. So in this area, we have so much heather around that heather is the, the natural choice for thatching. Oh, um, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, that so was fascinating. It, we, our craft workers go out and pull heather. That's a big part mm -hmm. of their job, actually, on some of the local estates. So they go wow. and pull it. So you need quite good lengths of heather mm -hmm. to be able to do the thatching. Uh, so that's quite a, a tough job that takes quite a lot of time. I can imagine. Yeah. You're constantly crouched on the ground as well. It's, 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 it's physically quite challenging. Yeah, yeah, probably with a lot of midges around as Ooh. well. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> and they, they're continually, um, the thatch is maintained. And so every few years, each building will need to be rethatched mm. and, and patched. So mm -hmm. it's an ongoing cycle of, mm. of thatching and maintaining the buildings because... When we first built the, the township, it was in the late 1990s. It's based on a site called Easter Rates, which is about five miles to the which right, west. <laughs> to the west of the museum. <laughs> uh, and it was based on the footprint of an old settlement there. Mm -hmm. So it was a much larger footprint that we've just taken a selection of about six or seven buildings uh, and recreated those from historical accounts and archaeological evidence and but a lot of it is experimental archaeology mm. as well so with the rebuilds it's kind of like well we think this is how it's done and so we'll try it this way and and sometimes you know sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but I think we've we've got it pretty pretty accurate and pretty well done now so we have really built up a lot of in-house expertise and we also work with partners like Historic Environment Scotland because they have specialists too so mm. it's a real knowledge sharing um, program that we have here and we've got some of our craft workers are, are very experienced in thatching and also do training for others mm. and so it's a real keeping those traditional skills and crafts alive is, is a huge part of what we aim to do here at the Folk Museum That's, That must be such exciting work <laughs> Well, one of the things you covered that I, that I was particularly interested in and probably many people around this time of the year who come to the area is the Shinti Pavilion. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the collection in the Shinti Pavilion? Yeah, absolutely. So the Shinti Pavilion, it came to the museum in 2012 and opened in 2013. So it's actually from Foyers, which is mm. a little village on the south side of Loch Ness. And it was built by the British Aluminium Company. So they had an aluminium smelter in Foyers, which employed hundreds of people. It was a huge employer. And they built the pavilion as a sports pavilion. And it was used for gala days and it was a big part of their working life and, and leisure time. And then it became more specifically used as a shinty pavilion. So the Beleskin and shinty team played there and they used it for, for decades. And then in the 90s, by the 1990s, uh, the team had got a new home and it was falling into disrepair and someone suggested that maybe it came here. Mm -hmm. And in Badenoch, we are in the heartland of shinty. And so it was really important to us to have a pavilion to tell the story of Shinti in this area because it's so important to the communities. Um, King Usi and Newton Moore in particular, you know, between them, they have won the Kamenak Cup more than any other team. You know, they are so important to the history of the sport and of Shinti that it made perfect sense to have the pavilion here to, to tell that story a little. Um, and for anyone, for who, anyone who doesn't, doesn't know, know Shinty is a fast-paced stick-and-ball game that came to Scotland from Ireland, along with the Gaelic language and Christian belief, thousands of years ago. In Ireland, it turned into the game of hurling, but here in Scotland, it developed into Shinty. It is one of three games that are considered native to the Scottish lands. There's golf, there's curling, and there's Shinty. My first introduction to the sport was listening to his history on the Bidenoch app. 
dance and despair. This is the beautiful and ancient game of our ancestors, alive and thriving today. It's an urban myth that Shinty is mindlessly violent. It's about as mindful as it gets, in fact, for the great art of the Kamen is to guard, to clique and to block, learning how to protect yourself while in close quarters with your opponent. There's no evidence, in fact, to say that Shinty has any more serious long-term injuries than, say, football or rugby. Shinty is not legalised violence, as some folk have said in the past. It's an art form, hard but fair. Shinty is to Bedenich what football is to Brazil. Shinty is, and has always been, fundamentally important in Bedenich to the well-being of the community. It's a place steeped in Shinty. In many places in the Highlands, now, I was a little sceptical. If it wasn't a violent sport, why would you lead with this kind of explanation? But I would soon enough find out that while not without its risks, Shinti is a fascinating sport to witness. I'm back in Kingusi, following a steady stream of people as we walk along a forest path that leads out of the village. Soon I spot large tents and trucks parked in a wide open field. A large crowd has already gathered around the pitch. There are no seats on the edges, just two relatively small bandstands, one by the middle line and one at the far end, behind one of the goals. Most people are standing along the barriers of the pitch. Children sit on shoulders, fans are wearing the colours of their teams, and face paint eradicates any remaining doubt of which side they support. Kingusi is playing Lovett in this final game of the Kamenacht Cup the biggest tournament of Shinti. The game is played all over Scotland, but while many communities across the Highlands had lost the sport and it had to be reintroduced, the communities of Bedenoch never stopped playing Shinti. Back in the day, Shinti was a game that brought people together, regardless of class. Lairds, army officers and doctors played alongside crofters, shepherds and labourers. The rules of the sport were few in those days, and the game's often pretty rough. Add some whiskey to the equation, or the icy surface of a frozen loch, and you've got yourself a bit of a riot. One of the earliest records of organised shinty matches in Badenoch were those hosted by the local clan chief, Clooney McPherson, and legend has it that entire villages would participate in games that could last for days. Shinty looked different depending on where it was played, well into the 19th century. Every region had its own rules for how many players were allowed in the pitch or how wide the goalposts should be or what players would wear for the game. But in 1983, it was decided to regularise the sport and play to the same rules across the land. The Kamenacht Association was born in Kingusi. Today, the children of Bedenoch are handed a Kamen as young as four years old. When players retire... They often stay involved in the sport, coaching, supporting at events or fundraising for their clubs. Entire families are steeped in Shinti history, every generation paving the way for the next. For the Bedenoch communities, Shinti is an integral part of life. Shinti is played with two teams. Every player has a hockey-shaped stick called Kamen, which they use to score goals with a tiny leather ball, about the same size as a baseball. The pitch seems oversized in comparison, as the players run from one end to the other. I find a spot with a good view, just as the game kicks off. Not knowing the rules and barely able to keep up with the fast movements of the team, I lose myself in the stop and start of the game. It's obvious that Shinti requires strength, stamina, and precision. But it clearly also requires a tough skin. It may not be mindlessly violent, but the collisions I witness look brutal. My shoulders shrink with every foul, and the crowd's oohs and ahs seemingly underlined every move on that pitch. <laughs> Halftime comes as a relief. Time to go for a walk and calm my nerves a bit. I do laps around the pitch and chat to anyone who's happy to speak with me. 
a woman who travelled all the way from Birmingham to support her team, Kingusi, a young girl who plays Shinti in Edinburgh but has Badenoch roots and a long family history of Shinti players. I'm most fascinated by a man who turns out to be an ex-Shinti player himself. He travelled to the game from Inverness, but surprises me by not actually supporting either team. It doesn't matter to him who wins. For him, Shinti is about much more than the result of a game. It's about the community that forms around this sport. And while King Gussie ends up winning the game, I'm intrigued to find out more about this other side of Shinti. The day after the big game, I sit down with John McKenzie, a Shinti legend from Newton Moore, chieftain of the Kamenacht Association and the driving force of the Shinti Memories Group. This initiative helps people with dementia or living in other difficult circumstances by organising get-togethers to reminisce and feel connected. What was very obvious yesterday when I went to the Shinti game was that big aspect of community. And yes, it's about the teams and the game and who wins and who takes home the cup. But really, it's about so much more than that. Very much so. Very much so. We're very, you know, we're very uh, community-minded. And the clubs of the community actually are, they're built around community individuals who just give their time and expertise freely, which is lovely. The history of the game is very much steeped in this part of the world, I have to mm-hmm. say. And, uh, well, it probably was a little bit uh, difficult for, for some. Yesterday, being Canucci in the cup final and winning it and uh, showing their expertise, which is lovely, which is great. But it's great. I was just speaking to some of the team there today, this morning, because I was down, taking banners and things down. The, the leader of it, who's Russell Jones, actually said the biggest thing for him was the fact that the volunteering element in it all stood out among it all. And you don't do anything without volunteers, as we all know. You can do everything to support them, but without them you can't do very much. So that was a lovely thing for him. Do you maybe want to tell me a little bit about, you know, what it means for people to be able to engage with what you do and and, and the the memories group and and bringing back those memories? What does it mean to people? Well, they love it. They're reminiscing. What we try to do is actually help them to reminisce. And uh, we use pictures. That's the main That's the main sort of catalyst to what we're trying mm-hmm. to do. We use pictures of old times. We use pictures of old games. We use pictures of old people. And, of course, the, the museum here is the ad- ideal place because the contents of the museum lend everything to what we're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, fortunately, we've got this great partnership with the museum here where we have at least once a month, we have people from each of the villages and the communities, well, that's Kincraig, Dalhoney, Lagan, Newtonmore, can you see, an inch and some years. And believe it or not, there's quite a number of people who sadly are living with dementia and, and not just dementia, but other illnesses as well. And we don't exclude anybody. So we try to take them, take them out. And a good number of them want, want to come of their own sort of, their own being, they will come Knowing it's here, well, we do we do uh, make sure that everybody's told. But what we try and do is we'll take a group from King Craig, we'll take a, a group from King UC, we'll take a group from Lagan, Newton Moore and the Honey, and they uh, try to involve them all. And the nice thing about it is they're on the occasion, they'll come from the village itself and they'll all join together and have their own little reminiscences about everything. And the other times, we'll mix them. Mm. And that in itself is a great, it's great fun. Uh, and we have great laughs and we've got great uh, rapport with them all. And uh, I think actually when they come in here or when they, they join us, wherever we might be, it might be out in the field, it would be here, perhaps anywhere, they all have their own reminiscences. Mm. And it's easy to talk with them because they remember of their youth, they remember of that time years and years and years ago. Then it creates its own sort of impetus mm. for people engaging. And that's the most simplest thing in the world, to be fair. There's training and everything else. We go through training lessons and things like that. And it's it's really lovely. It's really lovely. I I mean, I feel very fortunate. I'm probably one of the older ones now, but I'm very fortunate because I know most of, not all of the people that we want to engage with Mm. and they spot on. It's lovely. That's the thing. Shinti is kind of just a starting point, isn't it, as well? It's a great starting point. Yeah. It's topical. Yeah, because and everybody plays it. Apparently. Yes, like it feels like everybody is just. In we it. actually, 
we were brought up in school with it. Mm. You know, families were village oriented. Yeah. And that's where it all comes from. The, the togetherness, you know what I mean? We the weekend here was huge for not just can you see, but the local community and the rewards of it are spread mm. around the communities in different ways, I have to say. BBC television. You know, it, it covers a whole myriad of things in terms of the exposure of it all. And it's lovely to get that and see the people actually working at it all. I was staring at Kunishi, as I said already, and the, the turnout for them there was, as indeed it is here in the village here, you know, because we've got local Highland Games here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the village here is, is a hive of industry around the Highland Games. It's the first weekend, first Saturday in August every year. And only this year, the Games returned, having been through the period of COVID. That must have been it's a big party. It's great. It's a big, it's a big, it's a big, yeah, it, is, it, is, it does become a party. I've been in one or two, I've been in one or two, yes, as, as indeed this year be. But uh, no, it's a, it's a great, it's a great community venture. And that's the, well, that's the essence of it all, really. Mm. And uh, although, the, you know, there are separate... On my final day in Bedenoch, I venture out into nature again and drive south from Kingusi and Newton Moor deeper into the hills near Lagan. I pull into a car park, painfully aware of the drizzling rain that appeared much earlier than the forecast predicted. I walk over to the cafe and after a short chat with the staff there, I'm left with an e-bike by my side, bright red like a sports car and hopefully just as easy to drive. I do a few laps to find the perfect height for my saddle and set out along a flat gravel track. Signposts take me across the main road, away from the mountain bike trails of the Wolf Track Centre and over to the other side of the forest. The drizzling rain doesn't last for long, but the clouds remain hanging low seemingly teasing the very tops of the spruce trees that line the forestry track in front of me. The e-bike moves with ease. The suspension on the front wheel compensates for rough sections on the path, allowing me to climb upwards without too much strain. I'm on my way to Dundalav, a Pictish hill fort deep in the Lagan woods. It has never been excavated or properly dated, But like most hill forts of its kind, it is believed to have been constructed in the Iron Age, sometime in the first millennium BC. Its ruins are partially buried beneath soil and rubble, carried onto the hill over thousands of years. It's the kind of site where humans came to take control over nature. But by now, nature has gained back the upper hand. The fact that only a few traces remain visible to the naked eye makes it all the more intriguing to visit. The wide forestry track turns into a narrower path, framed by bracken and tall grass. Eventually, it turns into a rough footpath, and I leave the bike behind to continue on foot. The path through the forest is steep, and my breathing is heavy as I walk through a mix of spruce and pine trees. The ground is covered in a soft layer of brown needles, and moss grows between the trees. My final ascent leads through a patch of loose rocks. I love the sound they make as I step on them, moving them, maybe for the first time in many years. As I emerge at the top of the hill, I'm met by glorious views of the glens around me. Wow, that's unexpected. Catch my breath here for a second before I tell you what I'm looking at. The clouds, although still hanging low, are high enough to reveal this rolling landscape. And a lot of fog and mist. It's very ominous. Just the right atmosphere. The peaks might be hiding, but I see forests and hills, lochs and rivers, 
farms and lush green fields among dark brown slopes of heather and golden layers of dying grass. Around me on the hilltop are small stone structures, the remains of walls skilfully assembled. Some are toppled over, the insides filled with rubble and bracken, but the buildings are still identifiable as such. After thousands of years, the traces of the Picts are there for everyone to see. But the ruins leave gaps to fill with imagination. Tales and myths and legends surround places like these, of fairy folk and other magical creatures who roam the hills and woods of the highlands. Back down in the valley, near the River Spey, I meet a storyteller who knows many of these tales inside and out. Sarah Hobbs runs Strathby Story Walks and offers guided walks in Bedenoch and Strathspey that connect her love for nature with a fascination for stories. I tell her about my trip to Grey Gwe, the folk museum and Dundalav and realise that there's something that connects them all, the Gaelic language. One of the things I find so fascinating about Gaelic, I don't speak it, but as you walk through the countryside here and the landscape or learn about different place names. What I find so nice about Gaelic is that it always comes with a story and the place names aren't just descriptive or useful, they actually tell a story about the place and that captures so much of what that place meant, what people believed in and how they formed relationship with the land as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's I totally agree. It's very much... Here, it, it's very much the language of the land, which is what led me to, to, to begin learning it in the first place, because I wanted to know how to pronounce the things and I wanted to know what they meant. And I totally agree. As soon as you start learning, you you realise that really there isn't a, a tree or a rock or a hill, you know, a little bump that doesn't come with a story. And it's still only a snapshot of a, of a particular mm. time, but it's... They can be very descriptive or they can be, you know, full on mythology or they can be telling you something about the, the previous occupants or whatever it is. And it's this, this amazing tapestry and of layers and, yeah, I just think it's wonderful. And as a storyteller, that must be quite inspiring to then be surrounded by those kinds of landscapes and those kinds of stories the entire time. Hugely, yeah, and it's. I think a lot of it is also trying to collect. Well, co- collect the stories in that. I mean, a lot of them have been collected already and exist in, you know, like the archives of the Highland Folk Museum, for example, or in people's memories. I mean, yeah, because we're we're not necessarily talking about ancient history. We're still talking about history that, you know, people's grannies would have told them, or mm. and in books. So it's just bringing all of these things together. Oh, mushroom. I'm like, squirrel. (laughs) Um, Yeah, bringing all of these threads together into something that will then make sense and be memorable to people, I think, or or just sort of prods them to think, okay, there's actually so much here that, yeah, we could just be walking through the woods right now, but actually there's a whole story about the railway, there's whole stories of these, you know, in these woods where people have lived for thousands of years in many different ways um, with the ruins and whatnot. So, yeah, there's... There's lots of things, there's always lots of things. And the trees, and then the, the old maps that I found of these woods, and what trees we used to be here, and then what grows on the trees, and what grows under the trees, and what the trees grow with. And there's so it kind of depends what you mean by a story, because all of those to me are also stories in a mm. way. Oh, and I've just spotted a, a, a possible fly, Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What do you enjoy about telling stories? So for a start, I only ever, or I only like to tell, ideally, stories outdoors, outside, because they're, most of the stories, a vast majority, if not all of the stories I tell, are about place, they're place-based, they're about a specific place that we might be in now, or I I can point to it on a hill, or um, there are trees around that link to the story, and I can point to them, and I can, you know, get you to taste something of the tree, or whatever, so it's just... It's making all those connections and it's it's putting things in place in the landscape that people can then understand, you know, very much. I mean, I do tell storytelling, uh, I do do storytelling indoors as well, but it's just a totally different experience. Um, 
Yeah, so when I'm doing that and I'm pointing to everything and just the, I think the looks on people's faces, I just love and I don't get bored of it. Like I can feel like I'm like totally lighting up now, like thinking of people's faces. When you make things make sense to them and they see the entire landscape in a totally different way because of something, you know, very short that you've just been able to share with them, which is very wonderful. And I wouldn't, I don't think I'll get bored of that. Yeah, I think that's probably something I enjoy most about storytelling myself, even though I don't tell stories outside. I tell them in front of my computer and <laughs> record them in a podcast microphone. But once I then layer the sound effects into it and really create that sense of place and being in that location, I don't necessarily like listening back to the story and to myself, but the sounds and closing my eyes and remembering what it was like in that place, that's something that I love sharing and love passing on to others, whether they have been in that same place as me or not, whether they're only experiencing it through the story. It's such a lovely gift to share with people. It is, yeah, the connection. And I think, yeah, we were talking about connection a bit earlier as well. So, yeah, those connections, I mean, certainly all of the all of these stories and all of these things that I hugely change. I mean, I'm talking from a very personal perspective now, but they've hugely changed my relationship with the land, which is what I always uh, aimed for in a way. I just wanted to get to know a place very deeply and in lots of different ways and to see how all of those things interact with each other. And as soon as you know a story about a place, a particular place, let's say, it totally changes your perspective of it you feel like you know you will never see it in the same way again it changes your your literal view of it yeah I think it's one thing you know we we can see the landscapes and as we drive through Strathsby and Badenoch we see all the mountains and we see all the rivers and the forest and the lochs and the glens but that's not really enough for that personal relationship and I think the story is just put the people in it they put the people in the landscape that we can then relate to on a very very different level yeah or or the fairies or the giants or the gods or whoever it is you know <laughs> but, but that's still far more tangible than just a, a bare landscape with maybe a few horses in it now or a few cattle or a, a moorland you know um yeah I would I would agree with that can I just go and investigate that fungus before I'm, I'm, I'm... <laughs> Like Bedenoch is, without a doubt, a land of stories, steeped in history, memories, heritage and legends. They all blend together, forming a layer of depth on top of the natural beauty of the landscape. Experiencing Bedenoch means connecting with the people of the area and learning their stories, immersing yourself in nature and listening to its tales. Throughout this trip, I've done just that. I explored the landscape on foot and by bike, followed tiny back roads through forests and glens, watched my first ever Shinty game, and learned a few words of Gaelic. I've truly immersed myself in Bedenoch, the land of stories. I hope you enjoyed this trip to the villages, hills and woods of Bedenoch. This area is truly a hidden gem that hides in plain sight. Just off the busy A9 road and yet many people drive straight past it. I hope that you won't be one of them. Oh, and if you'd like to see the picture I took of the squirrel mid-air, head to our full show notes on wildforscotland.com where I share this and many other pictures from my trip to Bedenoch. The link is in the show notes. And now it's time for the practical part of the show. Here are five travel tips for a trip to Badenoch. Tip number one, don't just do a day trip. Badenoch is just south of Aviemore and really not that far from Inverness, but I'd still encourage you to do more than a day trip to the area. By visiting for a few days and staying in the villages, you get to spend more time exploring Badenoch and meeting its people throughout the day. I stayed at McKinnis House Hotel in Kinyusi and really enjoyed being at the heart of the region. Tip number two, use the free Badenoch the Storylands app. I downloaded the Badenoch app for inspiration before my trip, but I also used it a lot during my time in the area. It contains suggested itineraries and walking routes 
and a map with lots of local businesses and places of interest. There's also an augmented reality experience that you can use to bring historic ruins back to life. I mentioned two of them in today's story, Ruthven Barracks and Dundalav, but there are several others. My favourite part of the app, though, is the audio section. There is music, some of which was composed especially for the app, and many stories about the local history, people and folk tales. I really enjoyed listening to the stories and the music while I drove around the area, and it was a great way to learn more about the places on my itinerary. I actually still listen to the music from time to time. All the files can be downloaded within the app, so you can still listen, even if your mobile reception is patchy. If you enjoyed this podcast, I'm sure you'll enjoy the app as well. Tip number three, make an effort to meet the locals. The stories of Bedenoch are as memorable as the people who tell them. I loved meeting the locals during my trip here, whether it was for one of my interviews, chatting up strangers at the Shinti game, or a wee blather with one of the independent shopkeepers. I highly encourage you to approach folks, ask for their recommendations, and share a story or two. Tip number four, get outside to experience the land. Visiting attractions and driving from village to village is great, but nothing beats spending time outdoors to immerse yourself in the natural beauty of Bidenoch. It doesn't have to be a big adventure. There are many easy walks along the River Spey, and the mountain bike centre at Lagan Wolf Tracks also hires out e-bikes. If you're after water activities, check out the Loch Inge Activity Centre near King Creek, and for a guided walk, join Sarah Hobbs on one of her Strathsby story walks. Tip number five. Use my Bedenoch travel guide. If all of this has inspired you to plan a trip to Bedenoch, you can use my free travel guide for the area, which covers all the things you can do and see, suggestions for places to stay and eat, and lots of practical trips for a fun trip to Bedenoch. You can find it on my Scotland travel blog, watchmesee.com. The link is in the show notes. And with this, I send you off to plan your own trip to Bedenoch. The area is great for a short stay in the Scottish Highlands. I've actually just booked a return visit at a hot tub lodge on Loch Inge next month. But since Badenoch is on the road between Inverness and Edinburgh, it also fits seamlessly into most longer Scotland itineraries. I'll share some suggestions for this in this week's newsletter, so sign up if you're in need of travel inspiration. Next week, we're staying in Badenoch, and you'll get to hear my full conversation with Sarah Hobbs from Strathsby Storywalks. We'll talk about her life as a professional storyteller and what makes Badenoch such a special area to explore. I hope you'll tune in again. Thank you so much for listening to Wild for Scotland. This is our first attempt at mixing storytelling with interviews like this, so we'd love to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed the episode, take a screenshot of your podcast app right now and share it on your social media. And don't forget to tag us. Wild for Scotland is part of the Tremula Network, adventure and outdoor podcast off the beaten path. The show is written and hosted by me, Kathy Kamleitner. Thanks to Fran Tarowski, who is the co-producer and editor and does the sound design, and to Kirsty Spain, who helps with transcripts and social media. Podcast art is by Lizzie Vaughan Knight, the Tartan Trailburner, and all original music is composed by Bruce Wallace. Special thanks to Charlie McCarran for letting us use some of the music he composed for the Storylands app. Until next time when we travel to a different place in Scotland.